Welcome to Just Poetry, our first ever all community event. I'm Yvette Perry, a listener poet with the Good Listening Project. As you probably know, the Good Listening Project is a nonprofit dedicating to helping fight burnout in healthcare. That's our main thing. That's what drives us. That's why we started this organization. The Good Listening Project co-founder and executive director, Frankie Aberland, will say more about this. Thanks, Yvette. Burnout is a hazard in every field, of course. And good, good listening can make a huge difference in anyone's life. At the Good Listening Project, we are focused on nurses, physicians, social workers, and others who dedicate their lives to the field of healing. We got our start in healthcare. I used to work at Johns Hopkins Sibley Hospital here in Washington, DC, where I first experimented with this idea in a professional setting. That's also where I first learned about the physician suicide crisis and the burnout that's endemic throughout healthcare. Over the three years since we founded the Good Listening Project, we've learned a lot from talking directly with healthcare workers. One of the primary lessons, wellness and equity are inseparable. The roots of the burnout crisis are systemic not individual, it's the systems that are failing the passionate, generous healthcare workers of the world. When they feel heard and seen, they can step fully into their humanity and serve others. When they are put upon by racism, sexism, and other plagues of an unhealthy society, they wither without support and hope for change. We are here today to share with you some of the stories of the people whom your support enables us to help. You may want to have a box of Kleenex nearby, perhaps also a box of confetti. You're in for a really amazing show. I do want to alert you that these poems and stories contain content that may be distressing to some listeners we encourage you to take care of yourself and step away from listening if you need to. I also wanna take a moment to thank our major sponsor, the Chartist Just Health Collective. The Chartist Just Health Collective's president, Dwayne Reynolds, is a cherished member of TGLP's board, as well as of our client experience committee, the Clexcom, and I see some other members of the Clexcom are here this evening. And Dwayne is also on our audience this evening. I want you to know that he's a fabulous public speaker. And if you ever have a chance to hear him speak, I hope you'll take it. I also want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who have put so much effort into preparing this event for us tonight. We are very grateful for that work. Thank you, Frankie. For the rest of the hour, you'll hear several poems that we have written based on our deep listening with members of the healthcare community. You'll hear the poem read aloud and be able to follow along with the text of the poem on screen. Then we'll share with you some background about the poem and the conversation with the healthcare professionals that inspired that poem. Then you'll hear all or part of the poem again to allow you to really soak in the words. So now on to the poetry. In our healthcare system, providers who are themselves members of marginalized communities often take on additional responsibilities to connect with and advocate for their patients of color. To care for their patients, these physicians and other clinicians use the competencies they have developed through their many years of education and training, but they also deploy the skills they've developed throughout their cultural and spiritual life journeys. Now, reading listener poet Jenny Heglin's poem, Where I Stand, is Cambia Sojourn scholar, 
Dr. Kalia Johnson. Where I stand. I stand in a place that's been prepared for me. I can feel it in my bones. Bones that descend from the kings and queens our people have always been. I stand in faith, price already paid calling me to answer what's captured in scripture, a song that spans lifetimes, spilled from the mouth of a babe. I stand in hope, an anchor that shifts for a patient to survive free of pain for just one more day in sunshine enjoying their favorite ice cream. I stand in love, the only force big enough to push us closer together through the death of a child, through a pandemic, through war. I stand in your exam room your brown face next to my brown face. I see you in your beauty. I see you in the light. The Afro puff above your brow, your shining crown. Kalia, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jenny, and I had the um, privilege of meeting Kalia and writing this poem for her. So we're just going to have a little bit of dialogue to give you a little bit more of a, I guess, a peek behind the story behind the poem. So um, Kalia, I know that kind of the first thing you shared with me when we started talking was about this kind of magical moment that you had had with this patient earlier in the day. And it was kind of the, you know, this initial inspiration for this poem. And I remember you talking about how too often in healthcare, um, patients who come from marginalized communities are seen as problems or there's a, there's a lack of that's seen rather than like abundance and beauty. And I remember you saying that you are just feel so grateful and privileged to be able to spend these moments of presence with patients. And you said your words were to witness them in their perfection as humans. So I just wonder if you want to share anything else about the inspiration behind this poem and um, your approach to that as a, as a palliative care physician. Sure. It's such an honor to be here and to share some of these reflections and the story. So uh, this poem and the conversation was inspired by a patient I had seen earlier in the day before you and I connected. It's a beautiful young woman. She's 18 years old. She's lived her life with sickle cell disease, had a bone marrow transplant, which was very complicated, and then sadly was diagnosed with HIV within a year and a half of mm -hmm. recovering from bone marrow transplant. Um, and I went into a palliative care encounter with her and walked in the room and she looked just so beautiful that day. Um, and anytime I'm working with patients, I ground myself in remembering that each encounter is an opportunity to just be present and bear witness mm -hmm. to their experience as human beings. For my Black or African American patients, of course, there's a different level of connection. And I want to acknowledge that 
We know looking at statistics that 18% of the population in the U.S. is African-American and only 3.5% of physicians mm -hmm. in the U.S. are African-American. There's a huge disparity. Every time I have the opportunity to show up as my full self as a Black woman physician for my patients of color, particularly my African-American patients, it's a moment to connect to bear witness to their experience living in their black and brown bodies, mm -hmm. um, encountering the healthcare system. And how can I just be present for you and connect through that shared experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's coming through in the spirit of what you're saying, but something else that you shared with me, which you said, which no one else has ever said to me. Um, in, in these listener poet sessions, you said, no one wants to say that we love our patients, but we love our patients, you said. And then you said love was really your foundation, not only that, you know, that sort of drives you and how you serve today, but in terms of what you want to leave behind. And so I wonder if you want to say anything else about how love shows up in your practice and, um, you know, how you want that to sort of be left behind for those coming after you. Thanks for asking. <clears throat> when I think about justice and healthcare, I think there is a component of that that involves the, the presence of love. When we bring love to any circumstance in any situation, it is light. It is. It automatically, I think, allows for equity because it's a shared experience, right? This is what we all deserve: is to be loved, to be seen to be held, and particularly when people are living through their hardest moments in life, which is what I see in the work of palliative care, um, it's so important to bring love to that space for mm -hmm. our black and brown patients, any patient really who's living a marginalized experience or underrepresented, to show up with that loving presence where as mm -hmm. healthcare providers, we are listening differently, we're engaged differently, we're bringing love to the space. It says, I see you, you are important, you are worthy, and I'm here to care for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, gives me goosebumps. Thank you. Um, the last thing I want to to just ask about this. So this poem, you also, when we talked, you talked about your six-year-old son. You also talked about your ancestors. I'm looking and it appears that your dad is here in the chat. I see a comment from your dad. So we there's there's your family showed up in this poem as well. And I wonder if you want to say anything else just about how your family showed up in this poem or uh, sort of... Um, affects you and, and impacts your, your work and your life? Oh, it's so touching. It moves me so much. Um, my values are from my parents and my dad is, he's now in the generation of elders, right? It's very much uh, who we are as people of African descent to acknowledge our elders and our ancestors. We would not be who we are without them. My, my foundation, my core around justice and equity came from my father, how he raised me from childhood. So everything that I do in this space, when I get out of the bed in the morning, I go to my work to advocate for more access to palliative care for all children, um, particularly those who are marginalized. I think about those values that were set by my father and other elders in my life. And my mother transitioned the last year. She is now my ancestor and I have many other ancestors, Dr. Richard Payne, who is an African-American physician who, start, who started and led the palliative care service at Sloan Kettering. These ancestors lift me up every day in my work in palliative care and encourage me to press on towards the values of equity, creating more equity and more opportunity for all patients. Thank you so much. Yeah. And speaking of being lifted up, your poem was also inspired by the song Stand Up from Harriet because you shared about how much your son loves that song and, and how he sings it in the morning and that image still stays with me and also brings me joy. So with that, um, I'm going to ask you or hand it back over to you to let us hear the poem from you one more time.
where I stand, I stand in a place that's been prepared for me. I can feel it in my bones, bones that descend from the kings and queens our people have always been. I stand in faith, price already paid, calling me to answer what's captured in scripture. A song that spans lifetimes, spilled from the mouth of a babe. I stand in hope, an anchor that shifts for a patient to survive free of pain for just one more day in sunshine, enjoying their favorite ice cream. I stand in love, the only force big enough to push us closer together through the death of a child, through a pandemic, through war. I stand in your exam room, your brown face next to my brown face. I see you in your beauty. I see you in the light. The Afro puff above your brow, your shining crown. Healthcare involves more than the science part of medicine and involves more professionals within healthcare settings than the physicians, nurses, and other clinicians who might come immediately to your mind. These other professionals are often key to making the personal connections that create environments where patients can be truly seen and heard. And we cannot create healthcare systems that are just and equitable if the people within these systems are not fully seen and not fully heard. Listener poet Salam Green will read Live It, which demonstrates this theme of human connection. Live It. Welcome. At the height of a global pandemic, chaplains were not allowed in patients' rooms. In order to pray and beckon light and fellowship with those experiencing pain, hands were placed on windows. The laying on of hands, visible representations of meditation, compassion and action, where the selfless whispered wishes of recovery, the laying on of hands, performed by a minister who erected a metaphysical altar artistically constructed from wrinkled skin and 10 tiny bones. Then came the miracle workers, Midnight magicians, faithful family caregivers, and medicine men and women who placed their hands to the laying on of hands, visible representations of resurrected hope and encouragement. Whose hands would be placed on the hospital room's window? while you rested. Your father, a good father, a great father, who preached in countless sick rooms. Your father, a good father, a great father, who spoke to backseat pews filled with sinners and sanctified sinners. Your father, 
a good father, a great father who called neighbors on a rotary house phone to just say, I'm thinking about you. Your father who taught others that the laying on of hands is to live it, to live it, to pivot, to shift and embrace newness with fresh faith. Your father, a good father, a great father who taught a son to live it, modeling the roots of non-judgment when fear threatens the peace of humanity, live it. Laying on of hands, on finger spotted windows, where the spreading of the word of a good father, a great father, the father, a solace to the lonely, our single solemn devotions of imperfect gratitude, are sweet reminders to live it, to live it. Welcome. hands would be placed on the window of the hospital room you rested. Oh, I tell you, I interview Malcolm Marla, who is a former senior director of UAB's University of Alabama at Birmingham's pastoral care, who is now a leadership professional for UAB medicine, who's responsible for over 250 physicians who are in leadership. He's a healer, he's a chaplain, and he is the son of a Southern Baptist minister. <laughs> yes, I am from the South. We are all from the South at the end of the day. And when Malcolm sat with me in the session, which would be my first listener poet session after finishing my listener poet certification cohort during the pandemic, we sat in this busy hallway in one of the bus busiest biggest hospitals in Alabama, probably in the country. He didn't know what he was getting into and I really wasn't all that, what do you call it, professional and knowing myself exactly how to render this listener poet session. But you have to know Malcolm, over 34 years as a chaplain, everyone knows Malcolm. Everyone loves Malcolm. And I hope I will put him in the chat before we leave tonight so you can see a, a photo. You have to. He's a five foot powerhouse of a man who carries a Bible in his left hand, worn and torn, but in his heart, he carries no judgment. So the first thing I asked Malcolm after he hugged me with both of our masks on, so glad to see each other. I said, Malcolm, this poetry thing, I'm, I'm doing this poetry thing, this thing where I'm listening and where we're hoping to write poems for physicians and healthcare workers and really listen and give you something special after we're done. So I asked Malcolm, what did he want to tell me or talk about? And he reared back in his seat, head shining, 100% bald. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, Ceylon, during the pandemic, we were not allowed to go, of course, for safety reasons into patients' rooms. And this was really hard for me as a chaplain. How do I pray? How do I offer solace? How do I offer resources? Yes, we can do them through phone calls. Yes, we can do them through sending messages through their nurses and their physicians. But how, as a chaplain, for all these years, I am not in those rooms with my people. So he said one day, all masked up, 
all in his safety garb, his yellow garb that he puts on in his safety hat. He just put his hand on the window pane, closed his eyes, and began to meditate and pray for those persons behind those window doors. And he looked, and as he looked behind him, he saw social distancing nurses and janitors and healthcare workers doing the same thing. The laying on of hands. Then I asked Malcolm, if that was you in that hospital room resting, whose hands would you want on your hospital window? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I had a great father. I had a really good father. My father was the best father. And I would want my father's hands on those window panes, not just for me, but for all of humanity. I asked him, I said, well, Malcolm, what did your daddy teach you? <laughs> And he said, my daddy taught me to live it, to live out the care, to live out the concern, to live out the love, to live out the prayer. Before there was a pandemic, before there was a need to put the hands on window panes, he said his daddy had hands on window panes and cues and cars and telephones and people's shoulders because his daddy lived it. And I said, Malcolm, what is the one sermon that will preach for the rest of your life in your heart? And he said, live it. Two words, that's the sermon, that's the mission, that's the mantra, that's what connects us all. And I'm ever so grateful to my wonderful, wonderful friend, Malcolm, who was a friend before, but who's now a brother, <laughs> father figure, who I see live it every day. And after writing this poem, we got our little faces in what we call the UAB reporter. <laughs> we were all famous now for custom poems and everyone, the Good Listening Project. I'm like, go sign up, go do this and go do that. And Malcolm, he comes and he says, that his experience with the poem during the pandemic, during the poem where he was able to talk a little bit about the pandemic was emotionally healing for him. It gave him an opportunity to step outside of his experience and to learn important lessons going forward. He said he was not only grateful, but emotionally healed. That's what poetry does. That's what listening does. That's what Hearts of Humanity does. This is what the Good Listening Project has created. But more than that, this is what we get to create when we sit, listen, and witness with one another. So Malcolm and I are on a little tour <laughs> around the hospital. He has 250 physicians that have to live it. And we are together going to practice that through poetry and listening. And I have the Good Listening Project, Frankie, Jenny, Ravenna, Yvette, and all others and my cohort to thank for giving me this opportunity to live it and offer that today. So as I read this poem again, I ask you, hold your hands up to your metaphysical altar. Who are you holding your hands up for or to? Lay your hands as we reread this poem quickly. Lay your hands, my friends. Live it, live it. Your father, who taught others that the laying of a, on of hands is to live it. To live it, to pivot, to shift, and embrace newness with fresh faith. Your father, 
a good father, a great father who taught a son to live it. Modeling the roots of non-judgment when fear threatens the peace of humanity, live it. Whose hands would you want laying on that window while you rest it? Laying out of hands on finger spotted windows where the spreading of the word of a good father, a great father, the father, are solace to the lonely, are single solemn devotions of imperfect gratitude, are sweet reminders to live it, to live it. Whose hands will be placed on that window while you rest it? Live it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The phrase from that poem that you just heard, compassion in action, uh, that sums up so much of what we want from our healthcare system. But too often this act of compassion is missing. Next, listener poet Jenny Heglin reads her poem, This System, which highlights one end result of healthcare in which so many people can fall through the cracks. Jenny. Oh, Salem, thank you. This system. I feel naive for believing this system could be held to dignified standards. Giving time to explain why a person's loved one died. Adequately compensating investigators who there's no question we couldn't do our jobs without. For every autopsy, I read every police report, each suicide note. These are the people who don't come into the clinics before they arrive on my table. They are society's most uncared for. They are society's most uncared for. Mental health care, dental health care, better, better health care. We don't make it available, but we require a physician to sign every death certificate. We guarantee every person the right to see a physician upon death or in prison. It's too late. This is not good science. This is not good community. I want this to change. So this is a poem that I wrote in October of 2020, and it was for a person who was a part of the American Association of Medical Colleges that we did a large engagement with. And her story has really been traveling with me ever since. Um, she's a medical educator and also a medical examiner, and she specializes in performing autopsies for unnatural and violent death. She shared with me that most of the people that she performed autopsies on were impacted by alcohol or drug addiction and had other mental health um, conditions that also contributed to their deaths. Her story in particular felt really important to share as part of this event because it 
really reveals just how deep the inequities in our system reach, including the inequities around mental health. I remember and listening to her, how distraught she was, how the sort of the despair in her voice and how deeply she was grieving for the people um, who were dying day after day for whom it was too late. And this system, our healthcare system, this system that is our healthcare system was failing them over and over again. And another thing that really stayed with me from her story is um, she was also distraught about how her and her colleagues were being treated uh, because the system was also failing them. She felt like the more she cared for her patients and the more she tried to advocate for change, the less likely uh, she was to succeed in a system that valued efficiency above all else. The last thing that I want to mention about this poem that I just feel is really timely is that in the end, it really calls us to question this relationship between science and community. Um, can we have good science without good community? Can we have good community without good science? I remember her saying multiple times, I want this to change. I want this to change. And I am certain that if it did, this many people would not end up on my table. So just a, a last note about the poem itself. Uh, there's a certain sterility, I think, uh, to the structure and the language of this poem. And it somehow feels necessary, actually, to hold the heartbreak that I feel when I, when I really let the reality of this poem wash over me. So with that, with that context and with that invitation, I suppose, um, I'll read it for you one more time. This system. I feel naive for believing this system could be held to dignified standards. Giving time to explain why a person's loved one died. Adequately compensating investigators who there's no question we couldn't do our jobs without. For every autopsy, I read every police report, each suicide note. These are the people who don't come into the clinic before they arrive on my table. They are society's most uncared for our most uncared for. Mental health care, dental health care, better health care, we don't make it available, but we require a physician to sign every death certificate. We guarantee every person the right to see a physician upon death or in prison. It's too late. This is not good science. This is not good community. I want this to change. To make our healthcare system more equitable for all of us, we need the active engagement of people who live in communities that are underserved by that system. Community health advocates will often have a deep understanding of and love for their own friends, family members, and neighbors. In addition, these advocates hold medical professionals accountable for providing the unbiased, high quality, compassionate care that people in all communities deserve. Reading my poem, Redemption Song, is Shaquita Lassane, 
who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Shackle Free Community Outreach Agency. Shaquita. Redemption song. Will you help me tell my story well? Turning shackles into armor. Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. Will you help me tell my story well? Turning shackles into armor. Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. I was reading at three years old and I was married at 17. Missed the college I had planned and dreamed of when a baby came in between. Then I had to grow up real quick, though violence permeated through my bones. The words he threw can hurt me more than bumps and bruises caused by sticks and stones. On to another, I hoped could take care of me and protect me like a dad. I look back on it now and see I was searching for what I never had. Then I realized when the pain started, too hard to keep up the facade, that I could break through each barrier, become my own best acts of God. I'm breaking through each barrier. I'm my own best acts of God. Will you help me tell my story well? turning shackles into armor. Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. Will you help me tell my story well? Turning shackles into armor. Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. I was born already a statistic, then left home at 15 years young. The streets adopted me, first felony, first step up on the wrong. Full-fledged troublemaker, devil riding my back, and then spending 39 days in a coma, facing 30 more years in the pen. At that point, a five-time felon, hemmed up with no way through, asked God to give me one more chance, one more time to start anew. And though the system was not set up for it, I made opportunity from the dirt, created my own second chances by redesigning all my hurt. Creating my own second chances by redesigning all my hurt. Generations of being used up, burned up, beauty rise up from the ash, empower, encourage, motivate, inspire as we free up from the lash. Will you help me tell my story well, turning shackles into armor? Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. Will you help me tell my story well, turning shackles into armor? Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all she needs. Redemption is all he needs. Redemption is all we need. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Shaquita. Um, you know, I had the listening session with you and your uh, partner um, of your nonprofit organization serving underserved rural communities, right? And one thing that stuck in my mind when we talk is um, you both said that in your community, you are surrounded by your life stories. You said that, you know, you, you, everywhere you walk, you're surrounded by 
each of your life stories. Um, and I remember you told me you hoped that your experiences would help others, particularly young people, realize that they too could free themselves from the shackles of poverty and systemic racism and violence and other ills. Um, so why do you think um, that sharing your stories um, could help others? Thank you um, for writing such a beautiful poem for us, just listening to our story. But I believe that it is time for um, small grassroots organizations to have a seat at the table, to be able to share how it really is um, and having an opportunity to do that with a platform such as this, uh, the CDC and other uh, federal agencies that sometimes don't have an opportunity to really hear the stories and how what they do affect what happens in our communities and the safety of us all. And you just kind of alluded to this, but you know, your organization received national attention for its efforts in vaccinating members of your community uh, during the pandemic. Um, so why, do you, why is it that you think you were effective and impactful where the traditional healthcare system wasn't? Well, I believe that it's time for us to listen to the individuals who are involved um, we utilize beauty and barber professionals to spread information through uh, low income, um, BIPOC uh, communities, hard to reach areas. We utilize the trusted messengers. And I believe that a lot of time it is, it's lost in the system that we share information or information is shared from the top down, but it doesn't get to the people that really need to hear it from the people that they trust. Um, I am aware that in uh, 2030, they're anticipating a 5 million uh, shortage amongst doctors and nurses in the medical field. And just to understand that if that does happen, the projection does happen, then where will people go to get just basic information? And we were able to just bring it back down to the level of our people where we can actually make a difference. Um, they don't trust people that they don't, that they don't know. Um, in low income in rural areas. And so in order to flip poverty around, we have to have a seat at the table and listen to the voices from the community. Thank you. And just the last point, uh, when I wrote this poem, I created the first verse from the per perspective of your voice. Um, and the second um, verse was from the perspective of your uh, partner's voice. Um, but with the bridge and the last chorus, I really wanted to bring in the voice of your community. Um, so what is the one thing you wish that you could communicate to people who live outside of marginalized communities, um, you know, what, what is the one thing you wish they would understand and realize? I, I want them to realize that everyone matters, um, that everyone's opinion matters. And in order for us to really turn this thing around, we have to do it together. We have to eliminate the silos. Um, we have to all come together united. There's so many people doing so many great things, but until we put all of that together, we're unable to see the, if there's a solution if we're wasting money, if we're wasting funding on certain things that don't work. And I would love to see everyone working in concert with each other so that we can make a difference and we can stop the killing and stop you know, so many lives being lost in America. So I would love to see this concept spread across everywhere. Thank you so, so much. Um, and then just to close this poem out, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but. Um, I'd love to read for you that the voice of that community, the, the, the last, um, the bridge and the chorus um, as it ends. Generations of being used up, burned up, beauty rise up from the ash. Empower, encourage, motivate, inspire as we free up from the lash. Will you help me tell my story well, turning shackles into armor? Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all I need. Will you help me tell my story well, turning shackles into armor? Redemption is all I need. Redemption is all she needs. Redemption is all he needs. Redemption is all we need. Equity in our healthcare system will only occur through the hard work of each of us. For frontline workers, this individual effort may require constantly reminding themselves of the reasons they went into medicine and healthcare in the first place. The poem, I Am Here, 
by listener poet Elizabeth Pringle serves as such a reminder to self. I am here. Keep me here, where I hear the needs of those who have come clinging close to their hope. Let me be hope, trusting to this path, this purpose clear, listening beyond data. Make my heart open, away from the story of dead end despair, the cold back of cynicism. Give me courage to change the world, making meaning from unknown fears, holding each life sacred. This is why I am here. This man, this doctor, uh, was being pulled in so many directions. There were at least three points of tension in his life. Uh, he was a medical oncologist and a palliative care doctor and he was trying to give all of his attention to his patients and give them his full self at the same time being pulled by the administration to see more patients uh, because certainly the need was high in 2021. And then he had just become a new father. So he had uh, another pull from his family to be as present as possible to his newborn child. So his work kept him very, very busy. And he, sa he said, there was always a hundred more things to do. He hoped though that his work as a doctor would remain meaningful as the years went by. And that what he would not become cynical as change can be slow or non-existent. He called this the death by a thousand cuts. So in writing this for him, I, I wanted to make it sort of a mantra or a prayer for him to take, to take with him as he went forward, hearing all of his hope and then putting that up back, back to him, giving it back to him. I was surprised he had time to talk to me uh, being so busy, uh, but he did. He gave me all of his attention, all of his heart uh, into that listening moment. Uh, and now I'd like to read it one more time. I am here, keep me here, where I hear the needs of those who have come clinging close to their hope. Let me be hope, trusting to this path, this purpose clear, listening beyond data. Make my heart open, away from the story of dead end despair the cold back of cynicism. Give me courage to change the world, making meaning from unknown fears, holding each life sacred. This is why I am here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to honor these stories. If you'd like to keep supporting good listening in healthcare communities, we would love to connect with you. You can help us bring listener poets to your healthcare related workplace. You can make a donation to help us reach under resourced healthcare communities. You can become a listener poet. You can also check out the first season of our podcast, available on our website and wherever you get your podcasts. We would like to thank our sponsor, the Chartist. Just Health Collective for inspiring and supporting the vision for this poetry reading. We would also like to thank the Smith Center for Healing and the Arts for providing the Zoom capacity and especially to Carla Stillwagon for being our tech host. Thank you Sage Palm for the original music heard throughout and thank you to Shannon McDermott for giving us so much great advice along the way. Thank you to our team at The Good Listening Project for coming together to coordinate and plan this first community poetry reading. Thank you to our readers tonight, Kalia Johnson, Salam Green, Elizabeth Pringle, Jenny Heglin, Shaquita Lassane. Thanks also to our chat host, Elle Klassen, and our planners for this event, Jenny Heglin, Frankie Aberland, and Ravenna Raven.
and thank you for being here with us, for supporting this work and believing that good listening is healing. <laughs>